Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our third virtual um, garden workshop, um, Building a Sense of Unity. I hope your Saturday mornings are going well so far. My name is Katrina Lashley. I am Program Coordinator of Urban Waterways here at the Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, DC. So um, Urban Waterways is our um, ongoing conversation with our community partners, both here in um, DC and also other communities across um, the nation, where we've been um, engaging our partners in conversations around their connections and definitions of um, the environment. So how do they define the environment? How are they connected to their environment? Um, how are they willing to connect to their environment? And how are they willing to advocate and protect their environment? And how they see their environment as an integral part in their quality of life. And so part of the conversations with our, our friends or collaborators has really been about you know, the various parts um, that make up the community. So the blue spaces, the green spaces, and then the gray spaces. And this um, series of garden workshops really has been about this idea of connection to the green spaces in our communities. So how accessible are these green spaces in, um, in our cities, in our urban settings, and the power really that comes from being connected to these green spaces, regardless of how you choose to engage in these spaces and the legacy and history of this engagement over time. And so um, this growing season, which is now I think the, the 10th year of our urban gardening program, this growing season is very much inspired by the legacy and history of historic Barry Farm Hillvale, east of the Anacostia River in, in Anacostia. Um, the community was founded in 1867 um, after the end of the Civil War. Um, the Freemans Bureau purchased a large tract of land um, and they sold lots to families, some who had been free, some who had been formerly enslaved as they were building their lives post the Civil War and post emancipation. And so um, the lots were one acre. Um, some families were able to purchase several acres. Um, and this community of Barry Farm Hillsdale um, grew up and thrived um, over time. And so we were very intrigued by the work of our, our my fellow um, staff member and creator Alcione Amos here at the museum. And as she documented the history of this community, and she actually wanted to kind of trace this community um, and the um, individuals who came out of Barry Farms Hilldale, who really kind of impacted not only life in DC, but also life um, in the nation. Um, she was very struck really by the role of green spaces, of truck gardens in creating a sense of security, um, sustainability um, in the garden, in the community that really helped it to thrive over the years. And so a quick reminder, a truck garden really is a small enterprise where um, families or um, farmers, they grow um, vegetables, vegetables, sorry, vegetables, fruit, um, flowers for direct sale to consumers in various marketplaces. And so we were very inspired by the history of Barry Farm Hillsdale. And so we decided to grow for this season a modern truck, truck garden on university, at the museum grounds. And so I was very struck in conversation with Alcione about um, the power of green spaces, um, the power in terms of connecting to green space, stewarding green space, and expertise in green space that really has been a pathway to independence, to security, um, and to personhood over time. And so we realized that the um, community members, the people who lived in Barry Farms Hillsdale, were very much of this ongoing legacy um, of how um, people that lived in society that kind of deemed them as property found um, pathways to personhood, to emancipation, to security and liberty through the cultivation of the green spaces. And in our last workshop last Saturday, um, we had a celebration of Juneteenth, our newest federal holiday, and we highlighted the um, life of Olivia Tanner, born at the end of the 18th century and lived about half of the 19th century in Maryland and DC. And she found freedom, security, not only for herself, but also through many family members, where she was able to cultivate her garden spaces. And with those funds, she was able to buy her own freedom and the freedom of her family members as well. And so we really want to think about this idea of um, the impact, the importance of being connected to our natural green spaces, but also thinking what does that look like? So in the landscape that Alcione describes in her research and in her book and the images that she was able to find, you know, most of these one acre lots and these family um, properties are no longer visible in the current landscape. And so thinking about this, what was it like to open your front door? Houses were built to the front of the property and behind you would have orchards, you would have corn, you would have these various gardens. What um, did people's um, senses encounter? What did it feel like to move through these um, natural spaces, to tend these natural spaces, and to kind of share with your community members from these natural spaces? And how was that so empowering? How was that so important? How did it really shape people's definitions of themselves, their sense of place, and their, and their feeling of right to moving through the spaces of their community in a larger um, city? And what can we learn from that connection? And how is that really important in thinking about our physical um, and emotional mental health, particularly in looking at the last year and a half um, as we were dealing with the impacts of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, particularly on communities of color, how people turn to these natural green spaces um, as a source of solace. And how is that just a continual legacy that people have really been, um, um, I would say, um, practicing over the course of time. 
and how is it really important to highlight that legacy of connection to a green space east of the Anacostia River. And so to um, engage us in conversation, we're joined very fortunately by our garden facilitator, Derek Thomas, but also by Ms. Akima Price. And just, you know, full disclosure, um, Akima, um, I've been a fan of Akima's work um, for the past um, several years. She's been an ongoing supporter, collaborator of the um, Urban Waterways Project, but also in her 25 year plus career, she's really kind of engaged communities, both here in DC and across the nation, New York, out West, really in thinking about um, the natural world as a powerful medium to connect youth, adults, and families in meaningful, positive um, experiences that really affect their um, understanding of themselves and their connection to the larger community. So this idea of the intersection of social and environmental issues, relationships between nature and well-being. And she's been doing really incredible work that we're gonna learn about um, in a couple of minutes. She is a Washington, Washington native, um, and she's been doing some really important work um, at Acacia Park just down the road from where we are right now. And she started a career, earlier of her career um, at the Park Service. She moved on to various things, and now she's back working in the Park Service again. So Derek and Akima, I'm so excited to have you in conversation in the garden. Hello, we're all here. So I'll take a step back and have you lead us. up and I, I love all the work that you've been doing uh, with green spaces. Um, what would be your earliest memory growing up? Um, what made you, what made this be your passion? Well, first of all, I was raised by my father who was raised in the country. So he had these intrinsic nature values where he would take me fishing and camping. Uh, but we grew up not too far from here on the other side of Southeast DC. And, um, you know, we played in the dirt fields which at that time I didn't even identify as urbanization. I just thought, ooh, and we were playing in the sewer tunnels, which we thought was water. Wow. And then the foam we thought was cool. <laughs> it was just like, not really making the connections. It was urban environment, but I was really especially taken by, you know, just butterflies and, you know, the things that most kids that can have that kind of safe feeling at one point and chase a butterfly in a field. Um, I was lucky enough to live in the seventies to still, still be able to experience that in certain parts of DC. But it was also for me just like the um, how small, like when I considered how big it was, and just that feeling of like we're dust. Right. I loved it. That was I was sold, and then just you know, a variety of other ways nature has just shown up in my life and just confirmed for me that it is just everything. <laughs> and so, jumping off of nature being everything, how does that relate today, or even then to today? into community well-being because a lot of the work that you're doing is actually enhancing and making your community better hopefully yeah yeah it's about you know human, human development like nature-based human development where you kind of think about um you know so when i was coming up you know i the 80s began sort of the crack era and neighborhoods be became even more unsafe i mean there was always some element of crime but like it just kind of really kind of dc became the murder capital and it just all this stuff that was coming up and i noticed how you know People still gathered in parks, you know, people still found a way to come together somewhere. You know, I used to really trip out what people said, tried to say that like there was no nature in urban areas or like that we had to travel to Yosemite to experience nature. I'm like, no, DC has always been a pretty good. Oh, well, city. there was a really good song about Rock Creek Park. Hey, Don't listen, forget about listen. doing We've it in the, the park. park. Yes, yes. I think even amidst that, we still found these places. And I noticed how grieving people would often just find happiness at cookouts or find peace in gardening or, you know, people still tried to, like my parents, even though we didn't have a garden at certain times in our life, still had pots and potted plants and, you know, made a way to grow something. One, to sort of keep that tradition going that they had grown up on, but also just to maintain their peace. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we, we grew up, you know, my mom was, uh, when she migrated here, my dad had passed away, and we grew up in the projects right off the of Naylor Road. And I had every windowsill filled with potted plants yes. growing up. Yeah. So I understand your, your dad's sure. passion to make sure that you had something growing. Right. Well, and there's some people that grow for food. You know, some people grow because they can't afford lemons. I, I see people, I, I'm amazed. It's one gentleman over in uh, Lincoln Heights. He um he grows his own lemons. Yeah. Shout out yeah. Mr. Hill. Yeah. Um, and, and peppers <laughs> and so forth. You know, some of that, again, is for his peace, but it's also to sustain him because economically, sometimes those things can be expensive. And why buy when you can grow them? Yeah, um, you know, uh, last month we talked about historic berry farm uh, and um, the truck garden that Katrina mentioned, or truck gardens that Katrina mentioned. Um, you know, um, how do you think that connects to 
your desire to enhance, better, make more aware communities mm -hmm. that may be walking out and just experiencing a dirt garden. Uh, how does how has that influenced what you do with educating people about the importance of green spaces? Sure. Well, one, it's opening up the fact that you know, one, you have power. Like it's a form of empowerment that you can nurture something, you can grow something, you can care for something. Um, but bigger than that, it's expanding the idea that you know, green spaces are you know, you don't just have to be able to grow things. Because I myself don't have to be um, surprised. A lot of people don't know that. <laughs> Um, but you can still find a way to be of use to green spaces or find use in green spaces, whether you're recreating, whether you are just, you know, wiping your car down in the park. I mean, that's the best power, right? And and I know specifically for communities in Berry Farms and just who have probably made their way down to Anacostia Park and kind of had, you know, generational traditions to come into that park family reunions. I mean, again, people still find a way to those green spaces, whether they're using it to grow food or they're using it to commune with their families or even commemorate loved ones who have passed on. I've seen a lot of people use, you know, green spaces to commemorate people, uh, victims of gun violence. Um, I've seen people use, you know, cancer gardens, like all kinds of ways. And if you think about it, this is where we came from. This is another thing that gets me is when they want to reconnect Black people with nature. We were the original, like Harriet Tubman was the original environmental <laughs> educator. She didn't have to take an online course to learn what she learned. She knew it innately. You know, we used to make maps. And so this is something I think that lives within us and any opportunities we can provide to connect people with chances to, why do I like this? Or this feels right. Or, you know, I think that that's again, part of why I use nature because it's not a hard sell. And I don't try to shove information down their throat. It's just kind of like feeling the experience. So I, and I don't try to get people to come to where I am. I go to where they are. And a lot of people use parks and green spaces. So it's, it's not really as hard as I think some people like to project that you know, black people aren't outdoors and black people don't like nature. That's not true. You, uh, you briefly touched on Anacostia Park and the work in Anacostia Park. Tell us more about what you're doing there because it's, it's, it's an amazing program that you've got. And Give us a little bit more about what that program means to you. Sure. The work that you're doing in Anacostia Park because a lot of what you're talking about, you're walking the walk. Yep. Um, well, so speaking walk to walk, as a child, I walked in Anacostia Park. Like this was, I've been growing up here. So the, I've been contracted by the National Park Foundation to help build a friend for Anacostia Park. Um, and it's been three years, in, more than three years in the making, but I've been on board in three years. We just hired our executive director. It's almost Amazing. showtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the premise of this friends group is a little different than the traditional friends group. Like most friends groups are, you know, uh, well-to-do people, middle-income people that have extra time and want to beautify things. Whereas in this case, I'm looking at these folks that already use the park that might not write checks and might not even pick up trash after themselves, but still have some form of stake in this park. And we look at them as investors and we say, hey, listen, you know, we've been giving out these shirts. And so the, if love you it. love Anacostia Park, you're immediately a member, <laughs> right? And then we say, okay, well, how can you show your love? How would you like to invest your love in this park? So there's social capital, like we love to you know, um, tap into people's social capital and their ability to kind of interpret the park's issues to people, right? Because most people look at the bathrooms and think they don't care about us. Because, Well, there's a reason why those bathrooms and it's a million dollar fix and it's going to take some time. And it sounds different coming from someone who can speak the community's language versus a, you know, technical document that's online explain this to you. Right. Um, then there's the, the human capital of people that do want to come down, help keep the park clean, engage families. Um, and then there's the financial capital obviously people want to donate, but even things like $5, like if you, and like, I want to, I want these people to feel like investors and I want to treat them like investors. I don't like the word volunteer. Um, I think volunteer, especially in our communities is like community service. So if you see somebody with a volunteer shirt, you think like, oh, they're not the boss. I want to talk to them. You know, you kind of belittle people who are volunteers. And these people are investors. And so the premise of this group is how do we um, engage people who are already using this park? One, how do we help the issues of the park by helping people address their issues? So a lot of people come down there and get off their diabetes medicine because they're walking wow. the trail. You know, we, we intentionally do some programming between parents coming home from prison and their children so that they can begin to rebuild their relationship with their children. Like I've done some work where parents, as a result of the time that they spent in the park with their kids, were able to present a letter to a judge that then gave them better access down the road and proved kind of like that they were home and they're Amazing. trying to get themselves together. I mean, Amazing. I can so go it's empowering. Home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so our, our current thing is where we've got this Anacostia Friends Corps, which is a group of community folks who I've been training since the fall to lead programs. We've created, like we've got this thing called the Timeline Rap Gang, 
where they've learned the history of the park and we focus on certain things. We do, a, we, they're learning a focus on the African-American history of the Anacostia, like the Pearl. Like there's a lot of rich history that's happened in and around that park that we wanna make sure is included in the body of the interpretive tools as well. Not just the American features of like John Wilkes Booth came through the park or the bonus marches, very important things, but we wanna talk about the race drive. And you know, so really empowering the community to be almost like rangers where they can lead these activities as well and serve in the capacity like there's resource management rangers we're training people to be able to identify plants and um help help with identifying like ideas for deer management or you know we've got this big dcp where there's a design con concept development plan on the the meetings on the 29th actually where the communities now can actually give their input for what they'd like to see physically change in that part and so all these complaints about the bathroom so this is a place for people to bring that to right so just people start to begin to feel empowered that sure this is a national park and sure these rangers are here but this is my part we say that all the time right, right. and so, now do you do you feel that this this work this path is not only you know empowering communities but also strengthening those community boundaries because so many times what i feel happens is you have to struggle, you have to fight to get the bathroom at Anacostia Park. Whereas when you go to another park, I don't know what the background struggle has been, but it's already in place or fixed. Right. Well, so most of those parks do have a friends group. And because Anacostia has not had a friends group to kind of be that go between, I think that's maybe why the bathrooms have not been as much of a priority as seemingly in other parks, you know. Um, and so we're trying to get at that and make it more of a transparent process so that one, the park becomes accountable because you can, if in fact you are here for the public and you've got 200 people from the public saying blah, blah, blah bathrooms, you have to address that, right? But sometimes these people can't write letters. These people don't know the phone numbers. So again, that's why we're there to empower them to have a role as an investor, right? right. And then when you think about these people as investors, you respond to investors differently exactly. than you would say, you know. But then that's also going to strengthen when I say absolutely. the community boundary, it's, it's going to be, you know, you walk from one neighborhood to the next and there's a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. You know, you get, we were talking about Brooklyn mm -hmm. uh, before, the, before we started and, you know, you would go into other neighborhoods and you would feel the difference. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. The, the movie, The Heights oh, yeah. uh, just came out, but I saw the play years ago and it was all about that community, that Latino community in the Heights of Manhattan. Yeah. You know, and there was, there's so much. So, I mean, I think that everything that you're doing is so important. How can people get in touch with you? What can people do to reach out to you to make sure that they can be a part of this? Well, the um, website is still being developed for the Friends Group, but we do have a Facebook page. I live in Anacostia Park. Um, and there's also a group that I manage on Facebook. It's more national, but still encourage you. That's a way to find me is the Urban EE Collective. Okay. Um, and that's a place where we kind of share with like-minded individuals, people of color who have traditionally not been included in these mainstream environmental conversation because we value crime articles. We value articles about trauma because all these things kind of suit together in what we're trying to do in terms of using nature as a medium to help work with you know, our community. Excellent. And can you tell us the Facebook group again? Yeah, the Urban EE Collective. Um, Urban EE Collective. Yep. And um, I have my email. I mean, you can find me on Facebook, but my email is uh, Tima, A-K-I-I-M-A at apriceconsulting.com. Okay. And then also on Facebook. Yes. On Facebook. Now, you talked about not having a green thumb. Yes. And I'm going to challenge you to have one. Yes. Okay. Bring it. <laughs> so Bring it. so we, we set up, we did a little setup today. Uh, traditionally, this is a, just a garden program. So we're really going to focus on the herbs, but I also want to let people know that, you know, one of the nice things about sitting here with you with all of this beautiful nature. And I don't know if there was a caterpillar walking over there earlier. <laughs> you know, there's been bees buzzing around coming to the flowers. You know, it really, I think it's an important part of what is missing in so many communities is to have a place of solace. Yeah. You know, and I think gardens and green spaces, and you talked about just getting together for the picnic under the trees, you know, and in the backdrop, families are setting up as we speak mm -hmm. to do their, you know, Saturday cook out. Mm -hmm. And so I think all of those things are so important, especially if you're living in the concrete jungle. Absolutely. So we're going to go behind the table now. I'm going to get your hands dirty. All right. Let's we're going to take it away. All right. 
So um, a couple of things that we have uh, challenged our, our participants to do is to, if they don't have a traditional garden space, which is where we'll head over after this, um, they can still have a garden. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that you can do that is with container gardens. And so any, any container, anything that's plantable, you talked about your dad having container gardens, anything like this is, is and can be a garden. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have you grab some of those stones. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're gonna put some stones in the bottom here is this has a big drainage hole. So we don't want all our soil to, to weep out. So just grab a couple of stones and put them right in can the bottom. Can I ask you a quick question? Uh -huh. I, when I have tried to do plants, I've noticed there's some that don't have this and some that do. I've always thought this was a good thing. The hole is a very good thing because you need drainage. If it does not have the hole, some of the really decorative um, ceramic planters do not have holes. If the water sits in the soil, the soil will become sour. Mm -hmm. Once the soil becomes sour, plant roots will not grow into sour soil mm -hmm. and therefore your plants will not succeed. Got you. Okay, that makes sense to me. So never get, you never use a thing with not, without a hole. If you use it without the hole, it's because you want to bring a plant in decoratively and sit it like on the dining room table and you don't want it to leak. But then you take it, you put a, you put another pot inside yeah, of a have, pot. Yeah, sometimes have the little things. Right, the or the saucer. There exactly. you go. So that's enough stones there. You just basically want to make sure you cover up that hole. And then when I'm- Oh, gonna, that's the only purpose of yeah, the rocks. Yeah, that's okay. the only purpose, purpose of the rocks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fill that just about halfway there. And now what we're going to put in here, first of all, We've got a thyme plant mm. or an oregano plant. What's, mm -hmm. what's the favorite in your culinary? I just had thyme toast, so I would okay. like to Okay, so you want some thyme. Yeah. Okay. And you can leave it in this pot. There's nothing wrong with this pot. This is a traditional grower pot. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to put it on your front step, pick it up a notch. Right. You know? So they, they could grow their entire life in something like this? They could grow their entire life into this. You would have to go to a larger pot sure. over time. Like we've moved these chives, and we're going to talk about the chives in a minute. We've moved them into a bigger pot just because as the roots get pot bound, you want to make sure that they have enough place to spread right. out. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock it out of this container and you can see all these really, really fine roots. Mm -hmm. Now, if this were a tomato plant or a pepper plant, we'd want to try to preserve these roots. Herbs are really, really, they're almost weeds. <laughs> so I'm going to break off half of these roots because what I don't want to do is get it into this pot and have it become instantly pot bound. What pot bound means is that the roots have outgrown the pot. Oh. And then I want to just break this up on the sides. The reason we break this up, you see this fine mesh of roots right here? Mm -hmm. The plants will not be able to get nutrients through that eventually because the roots will just continue to wind themselves among them. So, so we're going to put this in there and then I'm going to let you take this soil. We're going to reuse this soil. I'm going to pull out some of the roots and we're going to fill in all the way around it. Should I do anything to? You're going to fill that in. What we're going to do is just fill, fill that in. Don't mind the roots. The roots okay. will decompose because we've taken them off of the plant. I'm going to pull that apart. That's going to be like almost making our own compost. But see that mesh of roots that we took away? Mm -hmm. That's what we didn't want. Yeah. And so what we're going to do is just fill that in all the way around that pot. And then when you get it filled in, push it down so that it gets nice and compact. And the reason that we do that is because we want to make sure that we get the air pockets out. Because anywhere there's air pockets in that, the roots can't grow into. Mm. So we push it down all the way. You don't have to fill it all the way up because what the good, the good thing about not filling it all the way up is you can put a lot of water in here and have it seep in. Whereas if it's all the way to the top, it might just run over. So this is your uh, thyme plant that you're gonna take home. If you wanna remember what it is, take the little, the little stick and stick it back in there. It's German thyme. This is gonna be excellent for your toast. Yeah, thank you. All right, now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was chives. A lot of people love chives in their garden. What they don't know about chives is chives are a complete weed. <laughs> delicious now, weed. It's a delicious weed. But here we have flowers. And a lot of people, when they when we get the fresh flowers, they say, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I'm gonna keep that on there. Here's what ends up happening. Those flowers become seeds. And each one of these little seeds are gonna have multiple seeds in there. 
And then you're going to have hundreds, if not thousands of time, um, uh, uh, um, I'm saying chives. Time, chives coming up all over your garden. If you don't want that, what you have to do at this time of the year is actually you would cut off the flowers. Usually this is a little tough to actually put in a salad or something like that. If you're going to use a recipe that requires that you cook the chives mm -hmm. down, you could use that for that. Or if you're going to do stock or scratch, you can use these. Now, it's really, really easy. We're going to get in here. And these are that. This is enough. Like if somebody, if a friend says, oh, I love your chives. Can I have some? This is all you need. Start a whole. Okay. So we're going to take this, break this piece off. That's already coming loose. There you go. Now sit that over there. I'm going to put the rest of the, the mama chives back. And this is a chive plant that I've been growing for over 10 years. Wow. I can't tell you how many people have uh, been gifted some chives. So that one's going to go down there. And now we're going to create our strawberry garden. And this is an old strawberry pot. We're not going to do strawberries in this. The reason it's called a strawberry pot is someone invented this and they would put strawberry plants into each of these, or they would start with a strawberry plant here and strawberry plants, they shoot off runners. And then they would put the subsequent runners down into the pot. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that. We're actually going to use our stones again. And you can dump them all in there, actually. I want to use all those stones. Once again, for drainage. Okay. And then, that's closed up the drainage hole. But also, what that has done is given us a really good reservoir because those stones, we're gonna do all herbs in this. So this is gonna become an herb pot. Those stones are going to hold water. So during the day, in the middle of the summer, when you give this water in the morning, that, those stones are gonna release that water. It's gonna evaporate back up into the soil as the soil starts to dry out. Nature. Okay. We're gonna take fresh soil and we're gonna dump it in there. We'll just keep on dumping in. You're, you're, you're a quick learn. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> and now when we get to this level, okay, yeah. no, no, no. When we get to this level, we're going to stop. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do now, lower level, let's do some chives. You can put one here. I'm going to do one over here to the front. Do I put my finger in? You put your finger, but just layer, layer it right on in there. Yep. You don't have to take it deep. You don't have to. You can put it in a little bit deeper. Yep. And then just push some soil over top of it like that. There okay. we go. And it doesn't matter if it's hanging. It doesn't matter if it's hanging because the plant is going to right itself back up. Why don't you do this one and let's get it a little bit closer so the viewers can see. Push that in the way that you did and then bring it across. The t yeah, there you go. All right. So we got three chive plants. We're going to do some basil. Mm. And now the basil plants, you see what I mean about it drying out? Mm. That's because it's so dense. The roots are so dense. You see the moisture line there, mm -hmm. and then everything here is dried out. By having those stones down there, we're going to prevent that. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get in here, don't be afraid of it. We're going to just pull it apart. And what happened is they planted more seeds than they needed. So one is going to go there, and then one is going to go here. So just like these roots still. Mm, the roots just stick them right on in there, like I just did that one. And then this one, Akima, let's do down in the front and get it on uh, so that the viewers can see what we're doing. All right, so we got three basil plants in there. We're gonna take some of this soil that's a little bit moist. And what that's gonna help us do is create almost like a damming effect mm -hmm. for the next level of soil. So when you, when you get to the next level, you wanna create almost a damming effect with that moist soil. And then we're gonna do, I pulled out one of your, Candy works. <laughs> We're gonna do another one there. Now, let me bring this back up and we can go ahead and keep filling it in. And as you fill it in, it's a good two person project because as you fill it in, I'm gonna make sure the soil doesn't come oozing out of the container. And am I packing then, or am I you, just... Yeah, pa pack that in like what you're doing, that's great. And now loosely, we're gonna loosely put the rest on top. So go ahead and throw that in. Throw a little bit more there. That's front, that's plenty. 
Okay, I'll tell you why. Our piece de resistance of this garden mm -hmm. is actually going to be twofold. We're going to do rosemary mm -hmm. and oregano yeah. up top. And the reason we're going to do the oregano is the oregano and the rosemary, the basil is going to die at the end of the season. The chives are going to continue to live and they're going to fill in the same way that this chive is a complete mass. They're going to mass out that entire strawberry. Oh, wow. This rosemary, we just planted this from a little tiny pot. It's got a lot of roots. I'm going to get rid of some of those roots because I don't want them to stay in that tight ball. I'm going to bring this over here. And then if you can grab me that oregano plant there. But I need to make this a little bit more reduced. They both fit. Break some of this up? Yes, break some of that up. Excellent. Yeah, keep on pulling that away. Now that is an, an oregano plant from last year. And you see how the soil has lost a lot of its uh, inorganic, uh, yeah. organic material rather. And it's just, it, it doesn't feel soft, yeah. right? A lot of the sphagnum and everything has been broken down. So when we put this in, and what I'm gonna also do is I'm gonna root prune that for you. Uh, hold it there for me. I'm gonna just prune all those roots so that it gives it a really good start. And then the other thing is uh, I'll show you, we're gonna squeeze, because like I said, this is from last year. So what I wanna do is break this root ball apart and as I said, with herbs, herbs are weeds. So we wouldn't do this with one of our delicate right. heirloom, great grandmother's plant because we could damage it. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna push that in there. So it's side by side. And the, so the roots are still up here, does that matter? That doesn't matter. With the oregano, the oregano, it doesn't matter. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna fill this in here and we're gonna push this down as best as we can. Get that pushed down, add some soil to that front there, and there we go. Now, so our viewers can see what we've created. We'll move some of the back stuff out of the way, clean this up a little bit. And now what we've got is the perfect summer herb garden. Mm -hmm. When you need your chives, you've got your chives. We've got rose. Rosemary. I just did a recipe with short ribs and I needed rosemary side. So we took some of this. Um, we've got oregano and we've got basil. So it's a perfect summer herb garden yeah. ready to go. And this can sit outside. This can stay outside all winter. If you put it out in the winter, your um, basil is going to die back. But that's a good opportunity if you wanted to add some decorative, decorative pansies. Pansies are edible the flower. Mm -hmm. So you could grow them in these three places where we have the basil over the winter. And when you want to garnish for some of your friends, put a little pansy flower oh. in the middle of in the, in, when you're having a winter party indoors. <laughs> um, you know, if you don't have a space, when you talk to people who come to the green spaces that you help make beautiful, they can see themselves, you know, taking one of these home, caring for them. This is going to give you as much time toast as you want. The only price that you have to pay is to give it regular watering. What's regular? It, it cannot dry out. So every if it's day. on, yeah, if it's on your front scoop and it's getting full sun, you want to hit it with some water every day. In the wintertime, not so much. Maybe once a week if we're not getting any rain. But yeah, it's for a little bit of investment. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about was another plant that People have really become into, I think because of the pandemic, uh, people have really become into teas. And so I want you to break that off and I want you to tell me what you smell. Break off one of the leaves. Mint. Okay. Um, what type? Oh, um, not pepper. No. Winter? It's no, it's beer. Yes. <laughs> Okay, this one, and you can see, actually, look, this is really good if you want to do a mint julep or if you want some uh, mint iced tea, mojitos. mojitos, this is the type of mint that you want. It's got a curlier leaf. Any of the bad looking leaves, the leaves that have started to yellow, if you get to them in time, they have enough essential oil in them 
sit them on a paper towel, dry them out for a couple of days to a week in the kitchen and add them to your favorite tea. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be like, if you've got one of those tea balls that you can, you can even make your own mint tea. Mm -hmm. um, now you said that one is our, this is our um, spearmint. What do go ahead and break off one of those leaves and tell me what you taste. Uh oh, peppermint. That's the peppermint. <laughs> and see, it's a different looking plant. A lot of people. I'm gonna move our strawberry garden out of the way. Bring our peppermint over here. Mm, my breath is clean now. <laughs> <laughs> now, see, it's, it's a totally different looking mm -hmm. plant. Mm -hmm. And one of the things to know about um, mint plants, the best place to grow them is not in your strawberry jar. Is not in it. it not in your garden in a pot really because look at look at all of the babies oh, wow. all of these little runners you mm -hmm. see this little purple thing mm -hmm. you see this one that's sprouting up mm -hmm. you see this next one here oh, yeah. all of these are baby plants this was one plant last year and now look at how many you have now is this guy ready for a bigger pot this guy's ready for a bigger pot yeah. or it's ready to be just divided oh. the other thing that you can do with your mint and since you were into your mojitos I will give you some. What you do with this is, if you're not making mojitos this afternoon, put them in a plastic bag mm -hmm. in the refrigerator. It will keep for several weeks. Wow. The weeks. mint, yes, the mint that you get, don't wash it until you're ready to use it because the water will make it go bad sooner. But the mint that you get in the grocery store in those little packages have probably come across country and have been sitting in the back of a truck for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get it into your fridge, it's already starting the process to die. With this, if you cut this now, you can go ahead, put it in a, in a paper bag, plastic bag. I know you've got other things going on today. When you get home, put it in a little bit of water, have it soak in a little bit of water, then let it let the water dry out before you put it in a plastic bag again. If it's not too wilted for you, just put it in a plastic bag and put it in the fridge. I'm going to use this tonight, though. Or you, well, see, some of it, some of it. If you're going to use it tonight, what you do is, because you were asking the other thing that we can do, what we're going to do is we're going to give you, you're going to have a heck of a mojito evening. Okay. <laughs> so all of that. And the other thing is you can dry out. What you don't use is mojitos, dry it out and make fresh tea. Now, what I'm going to do, and there's a stray plant in here. That's a weed. So we're going to take that out. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cut all of this down. Even the babies. I'm going to cut everything down. And once a year, all the mint that I have growing in pots, this is what I do. Now see what I mean about it? If oh, this wow. were in your garden, this would be running all over the sure. place. And it's one heck of a time to get it out of the rest of the garden. But what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna break this apart and then I'm gonna go in here. And I'm going to cut this And this is not killing it. Nope. So this here, this is all that I'm going to replant. Everything else here, I can put into the garden. I can continue to divide up. Even these suckers, because they have roots, you can plant that into a separate pot. But what we're going to replant is this, OK? And since you are a mojito friend, we are going to give you this little guy and you're going to have a, a first class lesson. The, the holes are small enough in here that we don't have to worry about putting the, the stones in. Okay. And, and then I have a first class, this, this is a soil mix. It's a, it's a soil less mixture. It's compost, it's sphagnum, it's perlite. Good, good question, because all of my, my garden warriors that follow us know I prefer a soilless mixture. Are the perlite soil is uh, soil less. What that means is it doesn't have any earth. It's compost, it's sphagnum moss, and the white stuff that you see is a volcanic rock known as perlite. Perlite will hold 10 times its weight in water. Wow. And that's the reason we're oh, using I that. Oh, I see, I see. And you now, don't want the earth materials because they are clay-like. They're and... clay-like and in a soil. That's so smart. You're, I have to tell people this. In a container, it becomes condensed mm -hmm. and there's no air in it and the roots won't grow into it. 
these four little sprigs, you're going to send me a picture. It's going to grow out. And you're I can't, have, I you're can't mess have, this up. You can't mess this up. Okay. If you mess this up, then we're going to give you some, we're going to give you some silks. Okay. We're going to give you silks. Okay. <laughs> you can't mess that up. So I want you to have your mo mojito mint. This I'll go ahead and deal with later. And you've got your time and you've got some good fresh takeaway. What's the watering situation? With the this watering's guy? the same thing. And with mint, if you forget to water it and it droops and it looks like it's dead, just hit some water with it. And all of these baby roots, these are loaded with moisture. What the plant will do is it will take all of the moisture out of its leaves to save its roots. And then when you hit it with some water again, it'll come back up. So yeah. nature is amazing. Nature is very amazing. Sit that in a clean spot, if we can find one on the table, so that when you get ready to go. And now we've got a couple other things that I wanted to discuss before we head over into the garden. And then when we head over into the garden, we've got some things that we're gonna plant. One of the plants that a lot of, you talked about uh, how African-Americans knew what to do with the earth and the plants. One of the plants that has been forgotten, and as a kid, you probably saw people growing these, mm -hmm. are marigolds. Marigolds are one of the plants that are a natural insect repellent. Hmm. So you can see that I broke this off and it's already, the, the smell is already wafting your way, that, mm. that really pugnant marigold smell. Mm -hmm. That's what the insects don't like. Mm. So planting this, our ancestors knew that you would plant marigolds among your tomatoes because there's a tomato hornworm. You were, um, the, the camera person was asking about uh, a little white butterfly that was flying around and that, that's where that caterpillar comes from that actually eats our tomatoes. Oh wow. But putting marigolds in are a natural way to have organic gardening and to protect them. Another thing that's a really, really good one, if you pick that one up, that's lavender. Mm. <laughs> okay, so I think you're taking a lavender plant home too. These are super easy. Oh yeah. These are super easy. And the great thing about lavender is when it goes into bloom, it's one of the best pollinators. You've heard all the story about bees and how we need bees. Mm -hmm. There's lavender honey. That's where it comes from. Because this time of year when lavender is in full bloom, the bees are going to be attracted to the lavender. The other thing that's really great about lavender is when it's in bloom, I just want you to squeeze that in your hand and then smell. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you can make really wonderful little lavender sachets. Mm -hmm. You can use this in a potpourri. So lavender is dual purpose. And in herbs de Provence, one of the herbs that are in there is lavender. So this- So can you can also this? use, you can use these leaves in your cooking. You can use this in, in um, instead of doing, um, it'll give it a different taste, but instead of doing um, marjoram, or instead of doing rosemary, you can try your favorite meat with some lavender. Wow. Yeah. It, it's going to give it a little bit of a different taste, but definitely. I'm down to try. Yeah. So we're going to take our marigold plants. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I hate throwing things away. If I did this, is this harmful? Or is no. Okay. Put it right on back in there. What doesn't, if none of, if none of it is viable seeds, what will happen is it will break down and over time it will feed the plant again. So we're going to take both of our lavender, no, the lavender we're going to keep here. Mm -hmm. We're going to take both of our marigolds, this one mm -hmm. and this one, and we're going to head over there. You're going to head over there with the camera person, and I'm going to meet you in just a second. Where the other Go ones straight are? through the garden where the other ones are. Perfect. Is that the butterfly you saw earlier? Yeah. So one of the things we have over here, Akima, and I try to have them every year in my garden, is sunflowers. Yes. And here's the deal. We put these in about two months ago. They're starting to get tall. Now, you said you don't like getting rid of plants, but there are times we need to get rid of plants. One of the times and one of the things that I wanted to discuss with our participants of the workshop today is when it's okay to get rid of the plant. 
And that's a time when they're becoming harmful to each other. And what do I mean by that? There's only so much space in this planter box. And there's only so much sun that these plants can get. If you look down here, I don't know if we can get a tight shot on here. Mother Nature's already taking care of killing this one off. You see how that plant's died out? It's because of lack of light. I'm gonna squeeze. So they're like out competing each other for these resources? That's, that's exactly right. Okay. So what we can do is how can we save the situation? This little guy here will produce beautiful blooms. But what I, what I would prefer is to have these three produce stronger blooms. So I'm gonna take this off. Now this, it's done. But what we can do is we can cut this up and we can go ahead and put this in, we can go ahead and put this in to our compost bin, okay? Now, as we look through here, which other ones do you identify as my junior gardener that would need to come out? Because they're just too tight. They're never gonna do anything but overcompete with the other plants. Yes, exactly. From first, I'm going to go in here, and then I'm going to go in exactly where you identified. Now, what that's going to do, if we can get a shot from over this angle, what that's done is it's opened up so that that one plant here has a much better chance of success. And then we're going to continue that all the way through. As we work our way through this bed, we're gonna take this one down. Now this one is a really, really, really tough call because you've got two that are growing right up on top of each other. But what can happen if both of these are vying for the same amount of energy, we can have a really strong storm and we can lose both of them. So it's one of those calls where you have to say, okay, one of you must go because I want to have the sunflower seeds. Because remember, especially when we're talking about the history of growing in this region, sunflower seeds would have been grown for the seeds to be harvested and made into sunflower oil, which would have been an essential oil that we would have needed for cooking in the winter. So I'm going to take the smaller of the two out. Is that typically your rule of thumb? Yeah, Tip, typically, typically, sorry, rule of thumb, the smaller one, the weaker one. It's the same thing that happens in the animal kingdom where the, the, the weaker animal gets naturally um, eliminated from the herd. I was trying to think of a, There's no, no good, way to say <laughs> a good way to say it, I know. Now I'm gonna go back through here. And actually, why don't you jump in? Well, let me These, ask you a question. What about this guy here? that's leaning like this and touching on that guy. Absolutely. Cut that out. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's another leaner. What does lean mean? That they're- It's, it's trying to get light. Yeah, it's leaning yeah. towards the light. Yeah. And then these one, two, three, I would say- They're already done, right? They're, yeah, we'll see what's happened is they've done what I'm telling you would happen, but they've done it a lot quicker. Yeah, but their stalks are so- yeah, their stalks are getting established. And what's gonna happen with this is it's going to just rot back into the ground and it's gonna produce nitrogen for the plants that are still here. But none of these stumps will regrow. None of these stumps will regrow. There's another one that's falling forward yeah. before, you, before you're quick to hand back. You I know you feel bad. To you. I yeah. know you feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And then let's take, if we can get in there, I'll pull this one out. Okay. And then, so now, the only other two that I would take out of Kima is this one because you see it's in the shade. Mm. So let's go ahead and you gotta get, look and above and below, and make right, fall. right. So let's. Well, first we just looked below, and now we're at a point where we're almost done thinning. This is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And here, this one. Let's take this one out. Got him, the Green Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I love it. I love it. I've got to bring you to, to workshop so that you can, you can apologize every time <laughs> I need to make an edit. All right, now we can set our pruners aside. Now we're gonna plant our marigolds and tell me why we're putting these marigolds in. Because they're going to help protect these tomato plants from insects that might not make them healthy. They make them exactly. healthy. Exactly. 
All right. So what we want to do is we want to think about the spacing of these. Well, hold on. First off, I realize this soil is a lot different from the other soil. This is like rocky. If I looked at this, I would think this is dirt soil. Right. This is topsoil. This is topsoil? This is topsoil. If you get, what happens is the more you water, the stones and everything come up, uh, the inorganic material comes up. Mm -hmm. But when I pop this open. Oh, there it is. There's your good topsoil. Okay. And it's actually a filtered topsoil. Even filtered topsoil today still has some stones and other things in it. Which is good. Which is good, which is good. It helps out. It's even got some clay. That's a chunk of clay. Clay is not bad because clay is loaded with micronutrients. So what we want to do is we want to open up a hole. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna take this out of the pot. Let's put the first one right now, first about of all, there. Is there any math to like mm -hmm. how far it is from these guys? Yeah, we're gonna try to put them centered from the, you know, from in the middle of both of them. Okay, and is there a particular shape other than like a hole, but like am I trying to make a medium size? Just make it, I would say make it a little bit deeper than what you currently have it and about the diameter that you have it. Okay. That's plenty good. They didn't tell you I was gonna put you to work. I love it, I love it. <laughs> Sweating and everything. Now I broke half of this off. Now what I had done with this, it was in one of those little tiny grower pots mm -hmm. and it would not have made this workshop. So a couple of weeks ago, I went ahead and did that. And you can see how quick roots will fill in. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put that down in there. Now remember what I said about having air pockets. We don't want an air pocket. So we want that to be flat. We wanna push that in and get in the air out. And now bring that good uh, my magic soil on back around the base of it there. Now, another question. Mm -hmm. At home, do you have a, a thing where you make your own soil? I mix um, sphagnum moss and um, peat moss and the perlite together. And sometimes, if I don't have the time, you can get a, um, uh, some of the companies have what's called a potting mix mm -hmm. if it says potting soil especially if you're doing it in a container you don't want to use it if it says potting mix usually that's a soil less mix if it has soil in it they have to say soil on the bag gotcha. so if it says potting mix that's usually your perlite and your sphagnum and your compost pre-made gotcha. and so when you've got all these different brands too like can you go wrong like is there a wrong brand like do you you fly in special perlite from, okay. I don't know, they you got all, a fancy. <laughs> they all, no, I ain't that fancy. Um, I just, I just, yeah, no, it's, it's, no, we don't, we, what we try to do is, um, because compost, there are manufacturers of compost that you would not particularly use um, just because they're not rated for organic gardening. Okay. Um, so in order to be sure, some of those soil mixes may not be pure organic gardening mixes. You have to look for that language. Right, because they've also now, the, 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 the soil manufacturers have gotten smart because mm -hmm. they, they want their bottom line. Right. And so when we stop buying, now they've got one of, the, one of the companies has a blue bag and the blue bag is all organic. So, yeah. And who's I, testing that even? <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, they do have to have, um, if they say organic, let me bring that marigold out of the picture. If they say organic, they do have to have um, people testing it. That was a great question. And certifying that it's organic. Mm. That's good to know. Especially if it's being sold as a garden. Is this within the USDA? Yes. Thanks. Our tax dollars at work. Outside of here. <laughs> All bets are off. I mean, there's countries that still use some of the heavier pesticides like diazinon and things like that that we just can't find in the marketplace, thankfully. Well, I was going to ask Darren, you your business. Um, do you? Yes, Katrina. Oh, sorry. Um, we have a couple questions. Um, okay. You know okay. Let's, so let's, very quick one. That. Yeah. Um, are, are marigolds edible? Marigolds are, if you've seen Monsoon Wedding, uh, yeah. 100% edible. <laughs> they'll and make also, the teeth orange <laughs> <laughs> what do they taste like they, they it's an acquired taste mm -hmm. it's um it's a bit bitter it tastes a little bit like a um like um it's got some sweetness to it too 
And also going back to um, the container gardens and um, the, the rocks, uh, the bottom, the pebbles. So they basically, they still allow the water to filter through, right, to drain out. Yes, the rocks will still allow the water to filter through, but what the rocks will also do is they will absorb the water in that strawberry container. Since the container is made out of clay, the clay will evaporate the, 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 um, the mix really, really, the, the water really, really quickly. So having the good base of, so of rocks in the bottom makes sense. What do you think about that taste? It's almost fruity, isn't it? It almost tastes a little bit like a berry. I still it? got some lavender mint, but I'm. Um, it's got yeah. a berry. It's got a berry taste. I can right? taste that at the end. Yeah, yeah. You've got a little bit of a berry, and um, yeah, but the marigolds are absolutely edible. So are pansies. Um, so are nest nesturnums. Uh, so there's edible flowers that you can actually have in your garden. Now, one more question, the other Derek. Thing that we've done. Yes. Okay, one more question because it's been posted for a while. Um, so Miss Kemp, um, and you've kind of touched this a little bit in the discussion of soil. So. How can I revive my soil? I have a garden bed that hasn't been used for one year. The soil is dry. There are rocks in the soil. Should I remove the rocks, wet the soil, add mulch? What can I do to make the soil come alive before I plant? If there's nothing planted there now, it's a great opportunity for the next two months to get the soil together. You don't have to remove the stones unless it's like over 30% of the bed is full of stones. Stones aren't bad, they're not gonna hurt anything, they're inorganic. Um, what you wanna do is you wanna add compost. You can do a commercially available compost that says it's rated for organic gardening. If you're able to get out to some of the places, um, even like in just right outside of here, Southern Maryland, there may be some horse farms. I know there's a horse farm in Upper Marlboro mm -hmm. um, that may be able to offer you seasoned horse manure. And you want to make sure it's seasoned. And you also want to make sure that you ask them if any of the fields that their horses eat in have been treated with any kind of chemicals. Most of the times the answer is no, because the animal cannot take the chemicals. So you want to do compost. If you want to add the, the commercial mixes that we were talking mm -hmm. about, you can add the commercial mixes. Um, build up the soil now so that at the end of August, you're planting seeds or you're planting whatever cool season vegetables that you want. But yeah, take the time to build up the soil over the next couple of months. Um, if you were so inclined and you can find buckwheat seeds, you can plant buckwheat right now, and then you can turn it over in about 45 days. You turn it under into the soil and the nitrogen decomposes and that adds nitrogen to the soil. Okay, Any other questions? No, that's it for now, thanks. Okay, perfect. So what we've also done here is we've added a little bit of our curb appeal mm -hmm. because before we came in, it was just all green. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sunflowers are gonna give us a beauty next month. We're gonna have a really beautiful garden next month once they clear out. But let's move on. So we've got those marigolds in. Bring your, uh, bring your work on. We're gonna go over here. And any of our viewers, uh, Katrina, if they have a way of identifying themselves from last week so we can get a count of folks that were in on last week and are here this week. And you remember we had some really juvenile green beans. And I told you the thing about green beans, I was almost going to cut them off last week. And I said, no, you know what? Let's wait until this week. The thing about green beans, they grow really quickly. So here, Akima, this is where green beans come from. Yeah. <laughs> and so you've got the flower that flowers out, but we've also got, and I tell you what, even if you've got a salad that you're gonna be doing this evening, because yeah. it's not a lot, but you want to taste the best green beans that you have ever, ever had. Uncooked. You, you, I chop them up uncooked and I throw them in my salad. Yeah. They're juvenile. I'll do it. Here's a couple more. And I'm talking, you are going to see. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Part of the marigold's gotten down my throat. You're going to see what all the buzz is about mm. with stevia. Ah. <clears throat> 
stevia is a is a plant it's like an herb and the leaf is so loaded with natural sugars but green beans are also really really loaded with a sweet sweet natural sugar is that why they call them sugar peas some no the sugar peas are the flatter ones okay. but all peas have sugar uh -huh. the sugar peas just have a, a, a bit more of the sugar um last week we left our kale and it looked really messy if you're doing a salad yeah i'm gonna give you some kale to take home oh man now what you're gonna do with this kale it's not the big well this is the big leaf and there's two different types of kale so one has a more serrated leaf mm -hmm. and one one has a more a fatter leaf and one has a more serrated okay. leaf yeah, yeah. That almost With, looks like arugula. It almost looks like arugula, exactly. What you want to do is you want to take out that center vein. Mm -hmm. So you want to break that out mm -hmm. and just break off the leafy part. Mm -hmm. But once again, fresh kale in that salad today. Oh, man. You're lacing me. We're going to check that came last week. We put these little guys in. These are pickling cucumbers. And the reason we're going to have these this fall is because they're the really short ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show... Uh, participants in the fall, hopefully live participants, not virtual, um, what we can do to create some really great um, uh, salads using fresh cucumbers. Oh man, you got those herbs to make your little pickled vinegar to go with that. See, you know. I'm in, I'm <laughs> All right, our tomatoes, we've, we've talked about thinning. I want to show our viewers something that we want to do with our tomatoes this time of year. And we can look at this one. You see how this has two very strong, what's called leaves. This is one piece growing up this way. This is one piece growing up that way. They're both going to produce tomatoes. The problem is it's going to get really, really wide. Okay. So what I'm going to do is something that's a little bit to some people counterintuitive. I'm gonna decide which one of these looks like it's the strongest. If you look, there's a break. I don't know if you can get in there and see where my finger is. There's a break here that actually looks a bit unnatural. And then the stronger part of the plant goes up this way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and cut that part of the tomato off, okay? What that's gonna do is it's gonna give me all the energy here. And you see, I've even got some juvenile blossoms getting ready to happen. And so by taking that off, and normally we wouldn't let it go to be this um, advanced. So on the next plant, I'll show you what you would do if it's a more juvenile that you're going to cut off. Question. You've got tomatoes over there and tomatoes over here. No marigolds over here. No marigolds over here. Mm -hmm. And no. are these the same type of tomatoes? No, they're two different types. That's a... That great, great question. That is a, tom a tomato plant that's actually grown as a dwarf hybrid Roma. So it's a Roma tomato. And this is a later tomato. It's one that's called Heat Master. And in developing this hybrid, they also made it really disease resistant. So we're going to try them out without marigolds and see what happens. Okay. There's a question about a trellis. When do you put in a trellis? When you put in a tomato cage or a tomato trellis, it's up to you. I would usually wait until you start to set that first tomato. And then once the flower finishes, if you start to set a tomato there, you can put the cage over it. The other thing here, Akima, we're going to cut this out. See, it's a lot younger. I'm going to cut it right there. Now I did cut away some flowers and I did cut away what could have been a potential tomato, but I'm gonna get much better tomatoes from there. We've got to go check our squash and then we're gonna check on our herbs. Okay. Hey Derek, oh, we have um, a question for Akima. That is, uh, a question for you, Akima. Yes. Okay, hey Akima. So um, from, let's see, Ms. Womack, um, do you think that the trauma experienced by African-Americans, especially in the agricultural South is part of why um, there's descendants sometimes do not choose to engage in growing traditions, heat, labor, is this changing? Absolutely, I mean, I would imagine so. I mean, if you spend generations in a field and the first thing you get, you become free, the last thing you wanna do is be in that field and the tra traumatic memories also that could be associated with being outdoors. That even you know ties over into people in water. You know, For a long time, African-Americans 
weren't trying to be anywhere near water and or didn't have that recreational time to go be in water. You know, so I think there's a lot of different factors in play around why people don't connect. Um, and it could also be, you know, some people just, everything ain't for everybody. But yes, that's a great question. I, I, people often don't make that connection, but yeah, I've heard people say last thing they want to do is be in the field. <laughs> but, yeah. but also I think to jump in on that, one of the challenges that we as educators have, uh, Akima, is to have people understand that there's a difference between being in a field because you're told that you have to and a desire to garden, correct? And gardening doesn't have to be laborious. Right? It can be something that's fun. It can be something that's educational. We were talking about the youth mm -hmm. and how your programs are addressing the parents to the youth. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be that whole um, generational wealth that we're teaching or reteaching, right? Or unteaching to teach. Yep. You know, yep. um, it, it, there's a lot there, but definitely. Yeah, I agree. I saw your eyes light up with these baby broccolis. And yeah. I'm gonna give you these to put into your fresh salad. I you've you've I got it. You've got to tell it. us. I hate probably cook the live. Wrong. Yeah. See, you've got to tell us. And remember, last week for the folks that were watching last week, we cut the broccoli, and that's to put into your salad. This is to show our viewers how fast the broccoli plant is starting to regrow, and these young greens, once they get big enough. We can cut those off and we can put those into a smoothie or a, um, uh, a, 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 a baby green salad. Here's one more so that you don't, Delicious. You don't have broccoli envy. Might not make it home. <laughs> you can washed? eat that, you okay. can eat that. No, it's all organic. And um, the young lady who takes care of the garden was here yesterday washing everything off. Mm. So it's totally clean. Oh man, yeah. And then, here is an education um, for our viewers, and I'm glad that it has decided to join us. Everyone has heard of, and most people in Prince George's County don't get to see a Japanese beetle. This is a Japanese beetle, and I'm holding on to it so it doesn't fly away. Now, the Japanese beetle was on our lettuce plant here, and what it was basically doing was eating our lettuce plant. And we had a lot of talk about the cicadas. Well, Japanese beetles in Prince George's County, they aerially treated Prince George's County decades ago with a product called Milky Sporum. It's a natural bacteria that feeds on the Japanese beetle larvae that's deposited into the soil. So Prince George's County almost has zero Japanese beetles. The perimeter of DC, Southern Maryland is loaded with these little boogers and they are just flew away. Um, they're beautiful until they eat your plants. <laughs> All of it, Tim. Oh, if there's a group of them, they will wipe you down just to the stem. Oh, no. Yeah. So let's, um, Katrina, just let us know if we have another question coming in. I'm getting ready to head over to the squash, uh, to the squash area. Hi, yes, Derek, we do have a question um, for you. Um, and we could think this will be page back up. So, and um, you talked about this before, but so talk a little bit more. Um, so what inspired you to get into this work and stay involved in this work? That's from Ms. Walmart to you. Um, my, my youngest memories, I asked my mother one time if I had grown pineapples with my grandfather. And she broke into tears because she remembered the pineapple patch that I had in Trinidad and Tobago. And so my youngest memories are being in the garden. My uncle on my father's side was an avid and still is an avid ornamental gardener. So as a boy, whether I was at grandma number one or grandma number two's house, there were loads of gardeners. And I was in the garden. And then one of the saddest things was when I came to the US and I talked about being in Anacostia right off the Naylor Road and we didn't have a garden space. So every window still became a garden. It's something that's always been with me. I haven't always done this for a vocation, but I'm fortunate that I listened and I got back into it. So it's my passion, it's my love. We're lucky too. Oh, thank you. So Akima, get over. I want you to get over here and see this. 
Look at what we've got. Ah, we've got baby squash. <laughs> you see there? Now they're not quite ready, but our squash hills worked. And when we, okay, so I'm going to give you a little lesson about why we did these hills. And you see how the soil is built up? Mm -hmm. Okay, what that does is it keeps the squash plant running off of the hill. We put in about three or four plants. The reason we did that is squash has to cross pollinate. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Squash plant number one cannot use its own pollen to create squash. It has to use another squash plant's pollen. And if we only had one or two plants, the chances that one of each plant would have a bloom is a lot less than if we have three or more. So now that we've got all of these blooms, and I don't know if we can get in here and see How all the different the blooms. Day? They were babies. They were tiny little plants. You see all these blooms? Chances are that this bloom from this plant and this bloom from this plant went off at the same time, and that's going to give us more squash. So we've got really in the next, I would say, I'm just going to make sure there's nobody big enough for you to take home and try in the skillet. I would say in the next 15 to 20 days, we've got a really wonderful squash harvest happening. This one's turned in on itself a little bit, and I'm going to take that off. If you want a baby squash, that's also good for dollar. Yeah. Take that. And the reason... So if you hold it up to our viewers, the reason that we took that off is because it was growing in on itself in the plant and would have potentially damaged the stem of the plant. We want to make sure that the squash plant, the, the squash fruit is growing straight out from where it came off of the, the, the blossom. But we've got a really good squash plant uh, patch happening here. And back here, Akima, this is our little secret area. We've got cantaloupe. And the cantaloupe is starting to grow down. And the intention that this entire area where my feet are is going to be our cantaloupe garden. Wow. Yeah. And do you, are, these, are these like traditionally grown together? You can definitely grow them together. They have the same, they have the same insect challenges. Now, that leads to the next thing that I wanted to talk about before we go over the herbs. I wanted to talk about. This is powdery mildew. The white stuff, it's a fungus. Last week, we took one leaf off that was loaded with it. There are sprays that you can do to prevent powdery mildew, but we're doing organic gardening. The best way to get rid of this is to, to identify it and remove it where you see it. And it usually happens where there's a lot of moisture and not enough sun. So you see all of these? All of these, I'm gonna take away. Oh, yes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take these away. And what I'm going to do is, and Margaret usually does a really good job of taking these away. You put it in a paper bag and you dispose of it in the trash because these grow from spores, which are like, like dust in the air. So we don't want this to spread back to the plant because look at how amazing the rest of the oh, plant yeah. is. Yeah. So by taking this off, we're keeping the garden organic and we're getting rid of a potential pathogen because if this powdery mildew spreads it, the entire within a week all of these leaves could be completely wiped yeah, don't worry about something like this this is regular <laughs> sunburn remember we had a cool season a, a cool period and then a hot period followed this leaf was probably just coming out then and the sun the heat of the sun from going from 70 to 90 made it burn out now i have a little test for you okay what plant do you think that is? This guy here? Uh -huh. And I'll give you a hint. It begins with a P. It's a starch. It was a staple in winter African-American diets because it was a plant that they could harvest in the fall and store in a cool area and cook things like tater tots. Oh, you're just giving it to me now. <laughs> Potatoes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Now we planted our potatoes from a potato that was from the kitchen. Oh, wow. So when your potatoes start to grow eyes, you can actually cut them mm. and you let them dry just about half a day. You want that starch to, to, to form a good solid closure mm -hmm. and you plant that piece of potato into your ground 
And when all of this dies back, when all of this aerial stuff dies back, we'll know that our potatoes are going to be ready. And they're under the soil. And they're under the soil, just like peanuts. Cool. Peanuts and potatoes are almost a similar looking plant and they grow under the soil. And what this guy looks like a pepper. That's a pepper. We put in two peppers. One is here. One is actually tucked in underneath the squash. And plant. that's okay. That's okay, because what's going to happen to the squash? Squash is going to go from zero to 90. It's going to really produce heavily. And then by early August, it's going to really be looking a bit done. And what we can do is we can then have, with gardens like this, our space is a challenge. So by planting that pepper there, it's getting rooted in. Once it starts to soar, we can start cutting back on that squash. But look at how much space is between those. I feel like, oh, they're gonna, no, they're gonna fill in. A pepper plant will have a two and a half to three feet spread and be tall. The other thing that we do with the pepper plants all the time, and the reason why most green peppers don't get that big in your garden, is we take off these juvenile flowers until the plant gets to be two feet tall. That's a baby pepper, yeah, you but you, it's not gonna taste oh. good. It's gonna taste bitter. <laughs> but so all of those, we're, we're going to keep pinching those off. And the reason being is I want my plant to get big and strong because then it'll produce big peppers. <clears throat> if you've ever had a pepper plant that made a little tiny pepper, it's because you let it go to bloom right away. Once it goes to bloom and produces seeds, a sweet pepper plant is done. It's like, okay, I'm finished. Hot peppers are a little bit different. Your jalapenos, your cayenne, all of those pepper plants like that, you can let them start producing from young because they overproduce mm. just because of their nature. So you intentionally have this space there. I intentionally have this space there. And then also this is gonna be one of the spaces in our July and August workshop where we're gonna look at other things that we can put in. Because I've got some basil growing out mm. as a secondary crop of basil mm. that we can pop into any spots that we've got in the garden. So smart. Well, we've got to layer it in because we're challenged <laughs> with space. Let's go to the herb. So it's not as simple as throw a box and throw some stuff in it. There's a science to it. <laughs> there is a science. Oh, this it. looks fun. Now you talked about arugula. We well, do have arugula over here. Okay, let's see. This looks like either Italian parsley. Yes. Okay. The, the, this is lemon balm? No, no, no. This is also parsley, but it's going to it's going to it's going to bloom. Oh. So it's changing the way it looks. Okay. What what about this? What do you think this is? That is watercress? No, no, no. Oh, no, because this is an herb. That looks... Oh. That's a, it is arugula. It is arugula, okay. <laughs> this is wild arugula. Mm. Oh so the God. arugula that we see in the garden is not so serrated. I mean, in the grocery is not so serrated. This is wild arugula. If you plant this, I've got arugula plants that I planted 15 years ago. Ooh. And what I do is I let some of them go to seed. See all those white blossoms? That's all arugula blossom. It'll produce seed, and then next year you'll get more, and you'll get more. And some of it will even winter over. So you don't have to touch this. You don't have to touch this, but what I do have to do today, because when the parsley produces a blossom, the taste changes exponentially. And I'm gonna give you a new, since you're into gardening, I'm gonna give you a new salad that I want you to try. Yes. When you get home, stick it in the water so it'll bounce back, the parsley that I'm gonna give you. Mm -hmm. Get the button mushrooms. Yes, I already have some. Olive oil. I have that. A lemon. I have that. Salt and pepper. Oh, yum. Fresh side salad. Best summer salad ever. Mm. It makes the button mushrooms that used to have no taste and we put them in spaghetti sauce or whatever. It brings them alive. Mm. Something about the parsley and that mushroom, which is a really bland tasting sure. mushroom, it really wakes it up. And that lemon. Yeah. Yeah, and the lemon. The lemon does that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut these off because the plant's going to want to continue to try to bloom. But what we want, and those are what you're going to stick in uh, water when you get home, and then you're going to cut off just the leafy part to create your salad. Oh, man. My cats are going to have a field day. <laughs> exactly. There's a couple of those. And now if you look in here, this is much more identifiable oh, and I can see as a parsley, yeah. you know? And so we're going to continue to do that as these grow up. We're going to continue to do that housekeeping. If you use sage, you're yeah. welcome to have some sage. You can dry that. 
going to be the best age ever uh, with your chicken dishes. And the more that you cut at your sage, the more that it produces. Oh, wow. You see that? It's, it's show a shot of that. So I, that. I could put that in water. You can put that in water if you want, or you can put it in a bag in the, in the refrigerator and use it as you need it. Or you can put it on a paper towel, let it completely dry out, chop it up, and put it into a canning jar. And then you'll have the best fresh dry. You have a blog. Ever. You have a blog. No, I don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I wanted us to check on before we go, um, and Katrina, how are we? Yes. Katrina, how are we on time? It's, you have 10 minutes. Okay. We transplanted our beets last week. And the reason we did that, Akima, was they were way too tight together. So I just took my fingers and pulled this one out last week. And I stuck it back in the ground and see how it's rerooted. <clears throat> now, I'm going to show you. Here's another one that we did. Now here's another big clump. If you can do me a huge favor, sure. bring me one of those hand uh, shovels. So this, these were a little bit juvenile and things happen really quickly in the garden, folks. This was all last week. We divided, we put one beet plant in there. We put one beet plant there. See Akima, you can see the top of the beet. See that? Yeah, you can see the top of the beet right there. Now, these were too young last week to futz with, but this week, they are perfect. Ooh, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna shake those roots out. Now, you converse to what we did with the, with the pot, I don't wanna destroy these roots. Okay. So I'm just beating this shovel at the bottom of it. I'm hitting at the bottom there and I'm getting it broken up so that I'm saving as many of the roots as I can. And then I'm going to select out some of these babies. I'm gonna take the two strongest ones. Those are for your salad. Mm -hmm. These two are gonna go back in here. And remember what we wanna do when we're replanting our beets is we wanna look at where that little bit of line was that was above the ground. It doesn't matter if the part of the beet is showing as it grows in, that's perfectly normal. We wanna stick that down in there. We wanna work the soil around it. And then it came the, the secret to this is you then pull it up a little bit till you get it to where it was. And then once you water this in, it's gonna be right at the same height. And that's really important because you can see here, that's the beet starting to form. You see that little bulb that's forming right there oh, yeah. in front of my, in front of my uh, finger now? Uh -huh. That's the beet starting to form. <clears throat> the root is what's giving it energy. So I wanna open the hole again. I wanna stick that root down in there. I want the root to go straight on down. And then I wanna bring this back. And so how many times do you have to do this often? What you do is you thin them out. Now, what we're gonna do, cause this is sort of a, first year experiment with the beets. All of the beets on this backside, I've left it nice and tight. The reason for that is they're gonna start growing around each other. But what I really want that for is the greens. I wanna have enough greens that when you're doing a smoothie, you can go cut those beet leaves off and they'll sprout right back up because they're really rooted in. So they're not gonna be wasting because they're so tight they're not gonna be able to waste a lot of energy producing that beet, but they're gonna produce leaves, so which are gonna be our weekly beet smoothie. So during this, when they're this close, they won't produce beet? They're gonna produce, but they're not gonna be able to produce them properly. So they're gonna overproduce foliage. Whereas these, you can see, this has only got like three leaves. This one that I transplanted last week has like three, it's got maybe two new ones coming out. So it's gonna be much slower because what it's gonna do is it's gonna dedicate its energy to the beet. This, because it's overcrowded, it's gonna be challenged. Now, do you do anything with these beets over here, the underdeveloped beets? I will, I will cut them off and use them in smoothies. And then the, the leaves will, will uh, come back out. But they're still nutritious. They're still nutritious. Yeah, really good. Or you could use them, if the leaves are juvenile enough, you can use them as a um, microgreen salad. Yeah. You can put them in that microgreen I salad. Yeah. Let's head back over to our work table. Have uh, you ever done microgreens? I have, I have. In in the fall, we are going to do that here. Awesome. 
Yeah, because what we do is microgreens <laughs> are nothing but baby lettuces and other plants like that. And so what we're going to do in the fall is plant out seeds. A couple other things that I wanted to talk about as we wrap up our garden is two plants that are not grown as edible plants, but are very, very important. We talked about the importance of bees with the lavender, and I'm going to have my guys pot this up into a larger pot for you to take home. Um, but there's two other plants. One is black and blue sage, which is this salvia. And this will attract the natural goldfinches. It will attract hummingbirds to your garden. Yes, we have hummingbirds in DC. Absolutely. You just have to plant the right things for them. Um, and it's a salvia. So the thing about a salvia is that if plant, if, um, if animals need to eat some of the leaves, they can. Um, but more importantly, the nectar is like just one of the best things that bees can find this time of the year. The other one, which is really, really important, and it's one that you can put into your garden, is milkweed. Oh, those are great. And this is the milkweed. And you see, this is not the milkweed that the roadside milkweed that's really, really invasive, but the monarch butterfly will be butterfly that I have seen for three years. Hey Derek, He's got a sorry, slightly... to interrupt. sorry to yeah. interrupt, but you froze for a second. Could you go back and kind of go over the marigold? Go back a couple thoughts. Go go back to the go yeah. back to this. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, this sorry, is marigold. this is the milkweed. And the milkweed is wonderful in the in the garden. It is a great um, plant to have if you want to attract the monarch butterflies, which do come to our gardens in this area. And what I was saying to Akima was, I have one monarch butterfly. And the reason I know it's the same butterfly for three years it's come, and it's got a part of its back wing that's damaged. And they're the monarchs that, that migrate to Mexico and back. Mm -hmm. And so it comes to my garden, hopefully to lay or to, to breed and then lay some baby, you know, lay some, lay some eggs and have some monarch caterpillars on the milkweed. Oh, I'm sure you're happy. So that. milkweed is like really a good thing to have. Yeah. But you know, even some of the things that we talked about time, when it blooms, you're gonna be attracting bees. The lavender, I don't know what space you have, but this is a plant that can stay in a pot for years. Outdoors. Right? Outdoors, outdoors. Not indoors. Not indoors. The, the, the time, if you wanna put that on your windowsill, you absolutely can get one of those saucers and the time will grow on your windowsill for just months and months and months. Um, and the same thing with your mint. Your mint should be outdoors, not indoors. But um, yeah, so do we have any other questions, Katrina? Uh, no, last, any last questions? Just put a call out. Don't be shy. <laughs> You're not shy. <laughs> not our guys. And how are we doing one time? We have three minutes left. Okay, one other thing that I'm gonna talk about then is, and I talked about it briefly last week, um, is the importance of adding color to our green spaces. And even if you have a shaded garden, even if you have a wet garden, there are plants that you can do that will add color. These two plants that look like banana plants mm -hmm. are cannas. And the cannas will grow in really wet, boggy soil. If you've got a place that's at the bottom of a hillside and nothing else is growing there, you can put those cannas in there. They will bloom all winter. If you have a pond, some people like pond plants. A canna is a wonderful candidate for a pond. So is it this bent leaf, does that mean it's gone? It'll eventually fall off, but it's still producing energy for the plant. And as the other leaves come out, if it's unattractive to you, you can cut it off no. or you can just leave it be. But you shouldn't make any effort to make no, it stay like No, I this. wouldn't. No, it's, it's probably the wind that broke that. So I would just leave it be. And even the yellowing leaves, I tend to leave them until they have faded. And then the other plants, if you have a shady garden and you say, oh, I can't grow anything. I can't get color into my garden. Caladiums, this is a caladium and this is a caladium and I brought the two color spectrums. They come in everything from a deep, deep, deep red all the way to a green and white. Yes. And they have all of the colors in between. Caladiums are really, it's a leaf plant 
The, the color comes from the leaves. It grows in the shade. But if you have a shade garden, there's no reason that you can't have color. And when caladiums produce, they do produce a almost a hooded flower that will attract bees to the garden. Quick last question. I live in a hood with rats. Okay. These are outside. Is any of this stuff going to be really attractive to rats? No. None of your herbs really are. The big thing that rats are get attracted to, and the reason people think rats are attracted to plants, is when you have a lot of ground cover because it gives them a place to hide from us or to create their burrows where we right. can't see it. Right. If you've got a pot, this is not attractive to them. <clears throat> okay, good. If it's a big pot and it's right next to an open garbage receptacle, maybe they will set up shop in there. But these pots are gonna be small enough and the water is gonna be negligible enough that it's not gonna be attractive to rats. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I'll bow it down. <laughs> So, Katrina, any other questions? Uh, hi, no, so no more last questions, but I just want to thank both of you for such, uh, for such an engaging, um, really just wonderful workshop today. Akima, we loved having you as our guest. Um, yeah, please yeah, come yeah. back any, any time. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful questions. Um, yeah, so this, I was, I was sitting, nodding and laughing, just having a really great time. Um, to our attendees, once again, thank you for choosing to spend a portion of your Saturday with us. We much appreciate it. I know some of you were asking about being back together live. So we reopened to the public as a museum on August 6th. And then we have to wait um, for our director from our, our director if we can start doing more in-person events on site. So I'm really hoping that come the fall, we can arrange a, a socially distanced um, harvest. So we're very excited to welcome you back. So please stay tuned on that note. Please join us July 24th. Um, for our next garden workshop. I'll be sending more information about that shortly. So once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Kima's kind of information I've shared in the chat. So please be safe under the rest of your weekend and please take care until then. Bye, take care. Thank you, Katrina. Bye, Akima. Bye. see you. Bye there, see you in a second. <laughs>